all other stories. I'm sure be scared. <laughs> what made you go from photography to video? I think... Tell us a little bit about YouTube because it, it's such a beast to kind of get, get your head around. I feel like um, YouTube is by far the best platform ever created. How do you write a title for a YouTube video? Tell us where the, the business side of your portfolio comes in. How do I pitch this to a brand, to a company, so that I don't only fly there and just spend money on it? The commercial side of things is always a bigger audience, a bigger industry, because you know we're consumers, so we're consuming every day. Give us some tips and tricks. I post the reel every single day. Think about what you're doing towards that goal and double it. Wow. How do we prevent ourselves from always wanting the next thing? There is a quote that I read not long ago, which like blew my mind. Today, I'm speaking with Luca Epifani, a filmmaker and photographer from Italy and founder of Define, a video production company shooting many commercial projects around the world. With his expertise in creating captivating visuals for travel, lifestyle, and brand content, Luca has dedicated over a decade to mastering the art of cinematography and photography. Luca's zest for culture and storytelling in the most unique and niched way possible was really interesting to hear about. And we talked a lot about how to tell stories with a camera and what the process of filmmaking is really all about. We also chatted through similar challenges that all visual artists have today, and that mainly revolves around the input versus output trade-offs we all take when it comes to how we get our work out into the world so that we may open up and maximize the opportunities and impactful impressions on audiences. So now I bring you Luca Epifani. Luca Epifani, pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome to the Mood Podcast. Before we get into the kind of um, gritty stuff. Give us a brief intro as to who you are, but more importantly, what you do and why you do it. So I grew up in Italy and I actually moved to Bali about five years ago now. And I've been doing filmmaking and photography since seven years. And I would say the last two, three years, I moved from photography video to only video now. And I specifically found my niche to be documentary, travel, personal brand, I would say. And I just kind of fell in love with the whole process of filmmaking. I fell in love with telling stories of people. I fell in love with the whole industry and specifically personal brand as well with YouTube and Instagram. And I'm just trying to mix all of it together, but with my take. Why video? What 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 made you go from photography to to video? Um, I think the the main reason is that I found that now I know you're a photographer, but <laughs> I found photography a bit too not easy, but like very like you know I would go to like all around Bali to these amazing places to shooting people and culture, and you can get so many nice photos in the same morning while video is a bit more like like you have to focus a bit more like telling an actual story and i kind of got really hooked on just not getting like the perfect shot but getting the whole story behind it um which is i think what kind of hooked me and then from there i kind of got kind of like pushed a bit more towards the video side in terms of like client work as well, because I find that I just find it more interesting to do, like tell a brand story through video rather than photos. And then I, yeah, I just kind of fell into it and I'm just in love with it now. What, so it's more about this, this story. You love the storytelling aspect. Yeah, of I like the storytelling and I also like to just be able to capture, you know, showcase different side of what is happening. I think one thing that I always struggle with photo is like, you know, you can have like different photos of the same subject, but it was always very hard for me at least to capture the actual environment around the subject. While now 
you know, if I go out and shoot like a ceremony in Bali, for example, I can tell the whole story of the ceremony rather than just like take one amazing photo of it. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with you. I think that's almost the challenge of photography for me, though, is like, you know, how can I? That's why I love environmental portraits. Portraits are great because you, know, you can really, hopefully, if you do it well, see the essence of a, of a human. But the environmental portraiture side of it just adds so much more to it, right? And, and I get that with video. For, but the, on the flip side, I almost think, well, video is much more three-dimensional. You've got more time to work, you know, so it's moving, right? It's, a, it's an evolving piece. It's more, you've got way more latitude to, to create. So then I think, well, that's kind of a, it's not easier, but it's, it's, it's different, but it's easier to tell, you have more at your disposable, disposal to tell a story, right? So there's kind of like this, you know, trade-off between what's, what's there available to you, what's easier, or what really what you, you gravitate to more and clearly sounds like yeah. video is your calling. Yeah. I do feel like photo is a bit more art in general rather than video but i do feel like video for me it just fits better for what i like to the way i like to tell a story i'd say okay tell, let's 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 talk about stories because they they are the they are the basis i think of human nature right we all love a story whatever whatever we're doing in any part of our day or people we love friends movies books everything it's just it always it's the the undercurrent to our existence what stories do you like to tell i would say that i like to tell story of things that i actually matter in the sense that i've kind of used to like you know over the last maybe three four years that i moved more towards video i kind of started to take on any client that i could get and on a personal brand level i would just kind of like go out and shoot whatever and now i'm gravitating a lot more towards something like a cultural slash documentary style but kind of with a with a modern approach because i find that a lot of this documentary work or um you know travel is like either you know very out there very extreme or very classic we would elaborate more what do you mean extreme or classic so it would be something like too like too many transition too like too many you know nothing to say about it but like too many backflips <laughs> too many girls running too many ig influencer yeah. real type okay. yeah yeah too many of that or too classic in the sense like too like national geographic got it too much like you know bbc kind of style yep. there's nothing really in between and if there is it's like very few people so i feel like there's a there's a good niche there and especially like I'd say the last few year, I've done a lot of work with NGOs, uh, especially here in Bali. I worked a lot with the Rescue 2000, and pretty much what they do, they help building families, uh, houses, and in like very remote part of Bali, they pretty much build the houses. They bring them food and stuff like that. So it's uh, it's very inspiring work, and especially here in Bali, I find that uh, when you see these people, they live in such crazy. You know, like in the middle of the jungle, you have to walk like 20 minutes. You can't even get there by bike down like a steep hill or something. And they live there by themselves with like a few chickens and a cow. And they're still like super happy. They're super smiley. So like it, make, like it puts everything into perspective. Like what do we need? What do we don't need? So it's um, like to be able to capture that and to tell that story. I find it very inspiring. I love that. Yeah, it's amazing. So on, on the other side of that, how do you make money? Well... Um, it is pretty lucky. Is it is pretty lucky that a lot of this NGO project actually have a pretty good budget. Okay, because you know the way you fundraise, uh, you have to show what you do. So these companies like uh, Karmagawa, for example, yeah, they're like a massive worldwide company who fundraise for every single cause that pretty much there is out there. Yeah, and I, I. I... Sorry to, no, to I just because you mentioned them and I see them on, you know, support them all the time. Yeah. Whether it's they're asking for donation or just sharing posts and stuff. Like, but, you know, it it drains me so much because it, most of their posts are just so upsetting, right? And, they're very extreme. Yeah, very extreme. But that's, 
almost that cognitive dissonance with humans. Like, well, I, I don't really want to see the bad stuff's going on, but I'm happy just to kind of, you know, feel better about supporting. Yeah. Do you fight? Do you, I think that's where someone like you really does make an impact because you can actually physically go and help, right? Whether that's making a beautiful film out of it or just helping, right? Physically helping. Yeah. I find, um, um, for example, like let's take Kamigawa as an example. I find that for, in Instagram, they share a lot of like viral mm. potential stuff just to get attention to it. But on the backside, I feel like the way they run, I'm not 100% sure of it, but I'm pretty sure this is how they run, is that um, they have that virality, but then they actually have so many causes that they actually, you know, help. And making films about these causes, then they pitch to, you know, high society people, and then they get funds to support these people. So the reason is, you know, you, you need to have a good video, you need to have a good, like, base to show what you're actually doing, otherwise no one's going to give you money. So you have to pay to make a good video to get people to pay you back and fund Got it. the whole cause. So actually it works by you giving them the content and then them paying for that license, essentially. Um, usually, well, I haven't worked with Kamigawa, but like for Rescue, for example, they would like, you know, have an idea, like let's build 10 houses in this one village. And we're going to try and fundraise these 10 houses, which cost, let's say, I don't know, 20K US, for example. So what they're going to do, they're going to try fundraise for that, but then also ask the fundraiser people to reach a bit, to, to raise a bit more money to also have a video so that both the fundraiser, but also the company can showcase what they've done Okay. to like future investors. Okay. That stuff. makes sense. Yeah. Any other NGOs you plan on working with, or is, is that the direction you want to go with, with all of this kind of exclusively NGOs, more impactful work? I think is definitely like a 30, 40% of what I want to do, but it's not only that. I think I want to focus a lot more on just personal brand and mm -hmm. uh, putting a lot more effort onto my YouTube channel and my Instagram and just grow that. But always kind of keep a direction where I tell stories of, you know, not just everything you've already seen, like not just like a beautiful place like Bali, but actually like the people of Bali. So that's why I... You know, one of the goals of this year is I wrote down a, a huge list of all of the biggest um, ceremonies, festivals, specific things happening like all around Bali and Indonesia. And I'm going to try and hit that as many as I can. Just go to like, I don't know, I found like a very generic one. Just to, just to mention one, like there is um, this volcano Krakatoa mm -hmm. that exploded a couple of hundred years ago or something. And um Probably a bit more, actually. A couple of thousand, maybe. A couple of thousand. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, every year on the day that exploded, like a bunch of people from the region go on top of the mountains to celebrate the fact that there didn't happen to them. And like just capturing like something like this all around Indonesia. Where is that? So the way see. It is in um, um, between uh, Java and Sumatra. Because I think that, that if I remember rightly, that, shaped a lot of what indonesia is today it was so it was the loudest huge. sound ever recorded right that's the one yeah um yeah it affected apparently the whole world like there was a huge cloud and but it's funny you talk about the kind of writing a list of the the you know the the full year of ceremonies and events in bali or indonesia or bali or, or bali. Uh, pretty much both yeah yeah we did exactly the same like nice. literally a couple <laughs> of weeks ago because i'm i realized having lived here for almost two years now I haven't actually captured that much of Bali. <laughs> you know, I've done other parts of Indonesia and other parts of the world, but um, it, there's something about if you live somewhere, you don't really give it as much focus as maybe somewhere that's more romantic, maybe somewhere abroad, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I wanted to do a, a photo series of, I mean, I'm building a, a much bigger one of Indonesia generally, but mm -hmm. Bali needs to be a huge part of that because it's so so rich here in, in culture and subculture. So yeah, we, we did exactly the same. And every time I'm back here in Bali, it's like, okay, I'm going to go out and shoot or meet some new people and hopefully, you know, tell more of a story with, with the photos that way. So maybe we can yeah, so join together. forces. Yeah. <laughs> Always need a video guy by my side. <laughs> yeah, um, let me go. Yeah, cool. Uh, t t tell us a little bit about the YouTube because um, it, it's such a, such a beast to kind of, get get your head around i know that you take more of um, a kind of educational approach is that 
the way you want to move forward? And if so, what, why that kind of tips and tricks, education type stuff? Yeah, I feel like um, YouTube is by far the best platform ever created. Really? I'd say, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's just like, you know, like on Instagram, people just scroll through. Same as TikTok, Facebook, pretty much that, I'd say. <laughs> so YouTube is like where the actually audience, they focus on something. They don't, they don't scroll through. They actually, you know, I, you know, I watch like 10, 20 minutes videos on a daily basis of all the people. And I feel like that's where the audience actually go even more than TV nowadays, like just to, just to enjoy, like not only just the content, but something like educational, you know, if you need to learn something, you go on YouTube, if you need to just, you know, entertain me, you go on YouTube. So there's so many aspects of it that you can kind of work around and there is a few reasons why I chose a bit more of an educational way is because I feel like a lot of people need to know more things. And still, like when I look for tutorials or anything like that, there isn't enough content out there, like specific content. So I feel like there is definitely a gap for that. Give so an there's, example. There's a niche. So for example, for DaVinci Resolve, there's I that you either find very technical very hard to follow color grading tutorials or you find almost two basic tutorials. So there's only like one or two or three that you can find that is kind of like in the middle, you know, for like the everyday user. So, you know, if you don't want to be like a Hollywood colorist, you just want to, you know, color grade in real. There isn't anything easy to follow along for that. So that's one niche, for example, that I'm kind of trying to put myself into. But then along with that, I want to also keep creating this kind of videos where I tell the story of what I actually care about, which is not only like, you know, teaching people, you know, how to shoot or whatever. It's more like telling the stories that actually matters to me. So going back to this like culture documentary kind of style, I am, I'm starting a series now. I published one video so far only, but pretty much what I do is I researched something very specific, like a ceremony. So let's take uh, Galungan, for example, here in Bali. So I'm going to um, go around all the island on Galungan, capture the whole ceremony throughout different villages, different temples, different streets, and then have like a voiceover where I tell the story of what's happening. Because you can either find a very cinematic video of Galungan, you can find a very like vloggy style video, but there's nothing like in between. So you know, a vlog style video is informative. It's fun to watch, but it's kind of lacking that beautiful cinematic aspect. Cinematic video is nice, but it's lacking the information. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm watching a ceremony. Cool. But like, what am I watching? So I kind of want to do that, kind of mix the two, but without the vlog style, I'd say like, I don't want to talk to the camera while I'm out there. I just want to narrate it and uh, have like a 10 to 20 minutes videos where I narrate like what's happening on like one specific part of Bali and um, the, the whole like idea behind it is like tell a bigger story about Bali rather than just you know go to Nusa Penida go to Chango go to Atu which there's way too many you know Bali cinematic yeah. 2034 yeah. <laughs> and the only story there is tourists there's off just locals. tourists there's no actual story yeah so yeah. Yeah, I mean, there probably is like under lay under the you know ten layers of yeah. crap that sits on top. But, but yeah, very few oh, though. Yeah, fine. How do you tell a story? That's very interesting. I find that it's very subjective. So, um, in the actual sense of it, I usually try and follow what an actual story should be told like. So I have like a start, something's happening, so you're interested to it, and then you kind of take that alive, and then there's like something else happening, and then at the end there's a resolution. So come out kind of try and keep that alive within all the videos. But for these kind of videos, for example, I would research something that I'm shooting and then I kind of just go out there and shoot. And then meeting people, luckily I'm like learning a bit of Bahasa Indonesia as well. So I'm help try communicate a bit um, and just trying to find out things that I don't know about and then tell that through visuals. And then, yeah, kind of go back home kind of put all the thoughts together and try and like put it together in a way that makes sense. Um, 
this is for these kind of videos. If it's a more like a brand video or like a, you know, like an NGO video, then I think just asking questions. Yeah. That's the best way of finding out what the story is and what to focus on. How do you, you talked about the aesthetics. I mean, it sounds like, I love the way you um, tar- trying to target a niche, right? I think that's, that's important as long as it feels good to you and, you know, matching what you want to do with a niche, right? It's like gold, right? That niche being the aesthetic somewhere between modern and classic and the story that, that is a story and that actually means something or hasn't necessarily been told properly before. Mm-hmm. With the aesthetics, how how do you how do you do that? So it's not a you know a, not a modern approach that's super fast and clickbaity and not so much a Nat Geo classic style. Technically speaking, how do you how do you kind of go about doing that? Give us some tips in terms of like actually the way I shoot. Or... Yeah, the way you shoot, the way you edit. Yeah, I feel like um, this is very like self proclaimed, <laughs> but I like to take a more of like a cinematography approach. So if you look at, you know, like planet earth kind of style of, um, documentaries, they're, they're very beautiful. Every shot is perfect. When you look at like a travel video, every shot is just like fast paced. The camera is moving. While if you look at films, everything is like, it's beautiful. It's perfect. But there is that kind of, um, there is that kind of look that it looks very cinematic. So the way you see like a planet earth documentary is not the same way you see like a, you know, like a film in the cinema. It just, it's just two different looks. And I'm trying to adapt a bit more of a cinematography look towards the documentary style. So I like to have, um, I'm shooting with a lot of like cine lenses, manual lenses. I like to have a bit more of like a shaky kind of look, a bit more like raw, mm-hmm. but still like beautiful. Not too many slow motion shots, more like real time, what actually happening. And just a different like look in terms of colors as well. Very like, you know, kind of toned down and very like a bit grainy, a bit of elation, you know, this kind of look that to me looks very cinematic. Yeah, because how you define cinematic, I think is quite subjective. You know, you, you look out there and you see YouTube videos about it's, you know, getting the cinematic look and everyone's different, right? It's, you know, some of it's down to color grade, some of it's down to what equipment you use, some of it's down to how you pan or how you, what angles you're going to shoot at. So it's, it's interesting to hear kind of, I guess, your take on it. Yeah. Um, but at, at the core of that, I guess, is, you know, you've got to match the look with the content. Yeah. You know, there's no point doing a cinematic film if it doesn't show anything, right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. So being able to tell a story, I think it's, it's very important because like you can have all the gear, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you can't tell a story, then yeah, it's kind of pointless. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about your equipment, what equipment you use. You, you mentioned some cine lenses there. What does that mean for people who, for laymen who don't really know what that means? Mm-hmm. Can you, can you explain a little bit more about that? So as in camera, I use a Sony s 3 and sometime I rent FX6, which is like a bigger kind of cinema camera. But I'm actually looking to buy one of those this year. So, how much a day? Uh, about 6K US. Okay. So, it's not too bad. Not too there bad. should be a new version coming out this year. So, when that comes out, okay, I'll probably get one. But for now, just Sony S7S3. And cine lenses are pretty much like a normal lens, but it's built for video. So, any lens that you can find, like a Sigma, Sony, whatever, they're usually made for photo. So it doesn't matter, you know, you can buy a 16 to 35 from Sony in Indonesia, you can buy in the US, you can buy in Australia. It's the same exact lens. It will look the exact same. Cine lenses are a bit more specific in the sense that they're made for video, so they're a bit more imperfect. So they have a bit more like chromatic aberration, a bit more halation. It's just like a different look. and a lot of them get like this coating um, on top of the glass that it just looks a bit softer while photography lenses are very sharp. Mm-hmm. So you get a bit more of like a um, cinematic look. Yeah. <laughs> just, you know. So um, yeah, the only downside is that they're manual lenses. So it's all manual focus, manual aperture, which is a bit tricky, especially 
a lot of these projects, I shoot them by myself. So I have kind of like one hand on the camera, one hand on like the follow focus, or sometimes I just focus by myself, but it's just very kind of complicated to, you know, if you're doing like handheld, it's very, very hard to like get the focus in the right place because also a lot of the cine lenses are super shallow. So mm. one that I love, it's like 45 millimeters, T1.5, which is like F1.1. <laughs> so it's like, it's so easy to miss the focus, but the the look that you get out of them, it's just something very different. So, yeah. So with, with that equipment, you have to have much more of a mindful approach, right? Yeah. Bit, bit, bit more, more deliberate with what you're doing and, and how you're going to do it. It's not so much like a, you know, go out there and just shoot whatever you see. I mean, you do that, but you have to be a lot more kind of in the, in the flow. Yeah, I feel like, to be honest, I still use like normal photography lenses also. I use a 24-7 a lot of the time as well. But for a specific look, for specific shots, I really like to use Cine lenses or even vintage lenses because they have such a unique look. Like there is this one lens, the Helios 44-2, and it's such a unique lens. It was actually the, the most mass-produced lens ever. And uh, it's so unique because you get like these bokehs that are almost um, like crazy ovular, like almost like a line bokeh, which makes it almost look like anamorphic lens, but it costs like 20 bucks, this lens. What is an anamorphic lens? Anamorphic lens is when you watch a movie and you get this weird like line flares on the lights. Uh, that's pretty much the easiest way to recognize <laughs> it. But there's also like different, you know, the way they focus, it's very different and the way they record video, it's different. They don't record in like 16 by nine, but they record in 239 to one. So you get like a very, like a video like this instead of this with anamorphic lenses. So everything is like, you know, you would get the look of like a 50 mil, but then when you actually get it out, it's like a 24 mil. So it's super spread out, but it's super shallow and it's super compressed. Right. It's very interesting. Look. It is. Yeah. yeah. Tell us where the, the business side of your your portfolio comes in. I know you you do some work with NGOs. You just said maybe 30, 40% of your work. And then the rest of it is what? It's YouTube, it's Instagram. Do you still do any commercial work? I do, yes. Every now and then, yeah. How do you go about pitching for that? Is that a very deliberate approach about who you want to work with? Or is it it's kind of, I need a job, let's go and get one? <laughs> I think it, uh, it depends by the situation and the client um from about a year and a half now i'm only taking on clients that i actually enjoy working with and i'm in the lucky position to not to have to look for work for now <laughs> so um, i'm enjoying that and like whenever people pitch me work i'm like i don't think i uh, either is like a too big of a project that i don't want to take on because i can see already like yeah you have a big budget but it's not worth the time because it's going to take me two months, which means I'm not going to be able to do this, this, and this that I want to do for myself. So I'm always taking, I'm always making sure that I'm actually keeping the time to myself, not only just seeking just the highest paid job. And um, I actually find myself to pitch a lot of work to a lot of brands. And the reason is because I want to get that exact work with this exact brand. So for example, uh, I'm in the process now working with uh, Artlist mm -hmm. for a project that we're going to shoot in this crazy floating market in um, Borneo. And, and we're going to go shooting that end of next month, if weather allows. Yeah, with just the like, intention of what? Um, just pretty much the idea is that I saw this floating market, which is the biggest in Southeast Asia, and it happens every morning in this one city in the south of Borneo. And I really wanted to go capture that. So I thought about it. How do I pitch this to a brand, to a company, so that I don't only fly there and just spend money on it? And the only pretty much company that came to mind was something that has to do, that doesn't touch my creative freedom, but they just want to be the supporter and they have their name on it. So one thing that I always really enjoyed is capturing audio Row from like what's happening and I have like a little audio recorder 
And uh, the the main idea behind the whole video was pretty much going there, telling the story of like a a lady who does that every day, because this market happens every day. Okay. But also capturing these like unique sounds because it's gonna be in the water. You know, there's like seagulls because it's near the ocean. There's a lot of different vendors shouting. So I want to capture the actual ambient sound of that. And I don't think you can find that anywhere else. So it's going to be a very unique soundscape. And once I figured that out, I was like, well, who can I pitch this? Mm -hmm. And I've been using Artlist for yeah four or five years now. And to me, it's like one of literally the best music company because of the high quality music and the sound effects. So I was like, well, I can pitch them. So I just found the contact, pitched it to them and they said, okay. Go. So just the sound? Um, well, no. So I'm going to capture like a video, but okay. the whole video is about the importance of sound okay. and how can sound can kind of change the way you see a video, you watch a video. So I'm going to get a bunch of uh, behind the scene of me, me capturing all the sounds and putting together a whole film about this lady who does that every day, but also like the side of things where I capture the sounds of everything around the market and stuff. Fuck audio. <laughs> when done well, it can transform yeah. video, but when yeah. done badly, it, it can ruin it's video. Hard. <laughs> it's so difficult. Um, it's hard. How do you go about, you know, take that project, for example, mm -hmm. where, you know, let's say I'm a beginner and I want to go and do something like that. Mm -hmm. And through luck, I get offered the job. Where do I start? What, what, if you're doing it all yourself, would do you, are you going to do that yourself or are you going to take some people with you? No, I'm going to do it with Zach. Oh, Zach. Okay. Yeah. So where, where do you start? You know, how do you, how do you go from here, nothing to coming back and saying, Art List, here's your incredible video? I think at the start, it's kind of tricky, but um, I would say just do the jobs that you want to get. And at the start, it's very hard because I guess, if you're starting out, you don't know how to get that quality. You don't know how to get, you know, the storytelling. So I would say just start somewhere and you're probably not going to get any brands or anything like that to actually pay for it. But what you can do is try and make exactly what the company is making. Just replicate, just replicate it like literally the same thing and then do it with like five or six companies. And just prove that you can get like the same exact results. And then you have like these five or six videos that, yes, they look exactly the same, like, you know, what companies did, but you understood how to make that. So now you can, you know, find a creative project that you have in mind, make it, and then use that as like a piece, like a spec ad and be like, I can make this. Let's say, I don't know, like a, like a skateboard, like 30 second ad, and then pitch that to all of like the companies like Vans. Like find mm. all of the companies around the world about skateboards and like skateboard shoes or socks, whatever, and just pitch them and show them that you already made something like that and you can do it. I think that's the, I mean, that's the best way. Just do the job that you wish you could do. Hey guys, before I let you continue with the video, just indulge me for a few minutes. I want to briefly talk about my new brand, Yore. Founded with my business partner and photographic artist, Finn Matson, we're proud to bring you a new artisanal jewelry and specialty coffee brand. Yep, what on earth do they have to do with each other or anything at all? Well, they're both our passions. They've always been another artistic outlet for me, now for over a decade. So for those that know me, coffee has been my other obsession since I was young. And as a result of it, I'm a qualified SCA coffee specialist. So when I met Finn, some of you might have seen my podcast with him when we barely knew each other, our love for art and jewelry had a home. And that home is here, House of Yore. Yore is, amongst others, an artisan jewelry label, and it's all about the art of intent for everything that we do. Our intention with Yore was to add a touch of celestial elegance and artistic expression to our visual narratives. Every jewelry piece is a statement, a reflection of your unique story and purpose. It's not just about jewelry. It's a wearable piece of art that speaks volumes. Picture this, silver or gold adorned with an actual piece of lunar meteorite. That's right, straight from our moon, making every piece as unique as the moments that we usually capture through our lenses. From limited edition lunar jewelry pieces to finely crafted 925 sterling silver and gold rings, pendants and chains, there's something for all of you in our unique designs. 
We're also committed to the environment as much as possible. Our coffee is direct trade, organically produced and locally farmed, minimizing impact on the environment as much as possible. Our jewelry packaging is all sustainable and recycled, other than the moon rock, of course. Proudly eco-friendly in both packaging and jewelry production, you can feel good about looking good. And to top it off, we offer free worldwide shipping, ensuring that a piece of lunar beauty can grace your collection no matter where life takes you. And if you ever find yourself here in Bali, please come and visit us. Our cafe and community-driven art house is a haven for creatives just like you. So before we head back into the video, please just take a moment to explore Yore's collection. And as a special treat for you, my wonderful audience, Yore is offering an exclusive discount. Head over to our website and use the code below for a 10% discount off your jewelry purchase. The link and details are in the description. Anyway, thanks so much for listening and I'll let you get back to the video now. Do you find like in, in more of our niche, so, so kind of like the, not documentary, but the more the human interest side of it, the, the cultures, subcultures telling those kind of stories, do you feel like there's less opportunities in those, that type of sector than maybe the brands for sure yeah 100 <laughs> percent. yeah well, why is that <clears throat> i feel like not many people are that interested so that and... means we're all fucking stupid yeah we're just yeah. wasting our time yeah, we're just dumbing <laughs> ourselves down <laughs> no i on feel TikTok like tiktok and instagram i feel like you know like the commercial side of things is always a the commercial side of things is always a bigger audience a bigger industry because you know we're consumers so we're consuming every day. So, you know, a commercial for like a clothing brand is always going to impact a lot more people than like a documentary about Bali because, you know, how many people actually care about Bali compared to how many people care about a clothing brand? Like the number is just, you know, just... I don't know. I I think, and <laughs> yeah, I'm probably the biggest misanthropist there is. I, you know, I'm not a big fan of human society, but in their defense, in our defense, um, I think they would be interested. I just don't think it gets in front of them That's because also the problem, it's yeah. controlled by huge corporations that just care about money, right? That's also the problem. When I say it, I mean our media spectrum. Yeah. So I, you know, I think I have faith that people people are interested. Maybe not, maybe not the younger TikTok generation, but I think I I, I believe that there is that that real interest and that real fascination and curiosity, certainly for people who may not be able to go and travel and see these places or meet these people. Yeah. But the, our human brain, it, it is interested in that depth. It, it has to be because we are those people. Yeah. I mean, the interest is there for sure because you can see like, you know, planet Earth is a yeah. perfect example. Like people love it. And if they don't, they've got an opinion about it. So yeah. it's still... Yeah. But the problem is like, there is not much, you know, there's not many companies who want to put that out there. Yeah. You know, it's not that profitable. Yeah. I think that's the main problem. So money. So it's money. <laughs> We're all fucked, aren't we? <laughs> that's always the problem. Um, but, you know, I feel like the world needs people like you and, and, and creatives in this space who are, who want to make an impact and want to tell stories. And even if it's for their own reasons, um, that doesn't matter. I think the, the more, and this is the beauty of this, this kind of creative revolution where we're all, there are so many more creators these days, so many more people getting into filmmaking and photography and self brands and which is which is both good and bad for many different reasons. But I I feel like from that will come will come more and more good and more interesting stories. And that's that's really what drives curiosity and hopefully and that's the beauty of YouTube as well. It's not I mean, it is controlled by a huge, one of the biggest companies in the world, being Google. But if people want to make something and put it out there, they can make something and put it out there. There's yeah. there's so few barriers to entry. In fact, there's nothing. You just need so a accessible. YouTube account. You need you just email. need the internet. That's you it. just need the internet. That's it. Yeah. Um, which is there for almost the whole population. So that's the beauty of it. Now it is algorithm driven. How how do you talk to me about your social media world and how much attention you put into that and how you whether you care about the algorithm because YouTube still has an algorithm, whether we like it or not, um, 
you know, I have to go through my titles and descriptions. Go, <laughs> is it SEO optimized? Yeah. Is it going to grab attention? But no, am I making sure I don't dilute the content or the, or, you know, if I have a guest on, I don't want to do them a disservice by putting a shit description on, right? Yeah. So it's, and I, I'm sure the same goes through your mind. Or do you care about that kind of thing? Or do you just, I want it, this is what I want to make. It's going to go out there. Yeah. Um, I don't want to care about it, but I have to care about it because, um, unfortunately that's part of the game. And if you want to be successful, if you want to have this as a business, you need to understand all of the business side of it and algorithm and, you know, titles and marketing, all of it. It's, it's part of it because you need to, you know, you can be the most successful, the most amazing you can be the most amazing filmmaker in the world, but if you don't know how to market yourself, if you don't know like how to write a title for your YouTube video, no one's going to know about you. So you need to put a time and like then find out what is the best thing to do and stuff. How do you write a title for your YouTube video? Sounds a silly question, but I struggle with it. It's, there's <laughs> chat GPT, there's, there's Google, there's all these tools that, you know, that you, you can use, but yeah. It's really difficult. It's hard. I think the way I do it, Elise, is I kind of, you know, once every couple of weeks, I brainstorm a bunch of ideas and I just write them down on my Notion template and, you know, I go through them every, yeah, one or two weeks and like I take off the one that I don't think they work. And I'd say once a month, I have at least like 20 to 30 ideas that I 100% know it's going to be good. It's going to be good videos idea. But then I run this through uh, ChatGPT sometimes. I just like write the title, like, is this going to be, does this have viral potential? And then it gives you like different options. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a bunch of tools like vidIQ, which is like a YouTube uh, optimizer tool that you can, you know, find keywords and stuff like that. Or the easiest way, actually, <laughs> uh, it's just write the title on YouTube and see if something comes up. Yeah. And then if something comes up, if it has a lot of views and it's recent, then there's an audience for it. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. So I think that's, that's the best way to do it. Just find an idea, write it on YouTube. Has it been like the past six months, someone made a video about it or something similar? A lot of people watched it. Then there's an audience. Okay. And to be successful, uh, on YouTube or whatever you're aiming your, your skills at, um, there's obviously many, many pieces of advice and people want to know they can watch a YouTube channel, but I wanted to kind of strip that back and ask exactly what success means to you. How would you define it for yourself? Success is waking up in the morning and being able to do absolutely anything you want. I think when time stops being like a problem, I think that's where success is. And it doesn't even have to be like anything related to money. I think it's just being able to do what you do on a daily basis without worrying about anything. So are you there? You're there. I'm pretty close, I think. Pretty close. <laughs> Good for you, man. Yeah, I think I'm pretty close, yeah. Because, I mean, there is like different side of success, for sure. You know, you can be successful like business. You can be successful in, you know, social media. You can be successful in many things. But overall success for me, it's just being able to kind of do whatever you want every day. Is leaving a legacy of that success important to you or is it just enjoying the processes you go through? I think both. Yeah, I think uh, because there is so many s levels and steps of success, I feel like once you get to the point that you're already doing kind of what you want to do, you already achieve such success. You already achieve, <laughs> you already achieve success, but then there is so many level, like, you know, you can be successful in the sense that you can do whatever you want every day, but you want to be successful in business because you want to get X amount of money, for example. So there is a process between levels of success that you're already successful, but you want to get more successful. And if you're able to enjoy both, then you won. <laughs> how do we, how do we prevent ourselves from always wanting the next thing? That's a bad question for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, or does it not matter? I think as long as you're 
always happy with what you have, I think that's all that matters. Yeah, right, but how do you there how is, do you be happy with what you have? There is a quote that I read not long ago, which like blew my mind, <laughs> which which is um, wait, 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 wait. okay, go. You already achieved goals. You said they would make you happy. Yeah, and like when I heard, I was like, oh shit, okay, <laughs> that that's it. Like I was like, if I move to Bali one day, I'll be happy. If I, you know, don't have to get client work anymore, I'm happy. If I get a thousand views, I'm happy. If I get a hundred thousand views, I'm happy. Like I already achieved things that I said I, it, that would make me happy. So why am I not happy sometimes? So I'm like, when I read that, I'm like, oh, okay, everything's fine. <laughs> because I can tell you why. Because desire is the fundamental basis of human existence because we we whether it's whatever level of life you're at or whatever demographic you're in there is you wake up every day and you want something whether that's a kind of need want whether you're at the bottom of that ladder in terms of i i want food to survive right i want my kid to be healthy or i want to go on holiday or i want this camera or whatever it is i want to make a difference i want to make an impact i want to tell a story I want, I want, I want, I want a beer, I want a cigarette, whatever it is, right? Yeah. So it's so difficult for us innately to be able to just get rid of that. You cannot expunge that need for that that wanting in life, whatever I don't think, whatever it may be. I don't think that's a bad thing as long no, as you manage it. I think desire, it's, you know, if you know how to manage it and if you're happy with, you know, the process of getting there, because otherwise if you would have, everything you ever wanted like what what else do you do well i think that the answer not the answer but a a kind of mitigating factor is is to be grateful for what like you said earlier for those desires that you had 10 20 years ago or one year ago that you can look back on and go oh I, oh yeah i kind of did that right um can easily get forgotten about so it's uh, I don't know how we've gone down this rabbit hole, but I don't know. <laughs> it's it's definitely interesting because you're you're sat there across from me saying you know I'm I'm pretty pretty happy with where I'm at. Um, most most people think the word success means a million bucks, right? Three houses, and those people I know that do have that, they're far from happy, right? So it's it's not it's never ever it's certainly in my opinion and my experience ever about money or material things. Right? It's a lot of people will sit across from me and I, I'm actually one of those guys. This is about freedom. It's that time and money freedom. Um, and I think they go hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, money freedom doesn't mean you have loads of money, but it means you're not worried about where the next buck is coming from, right? Because that's just stress. To get to that point, you know, now, now kind of I want to angle it towards your audience, my audience, and people who look at you and go, yeah, I want to do that. Um, or I want to be, you know, happy and I want to wake up feeling that I have a level of success in my life, right? And not be pressured to have to do this or have to go to work or be, you know, under some amount of stress, whatever that may be. Give us a kind of, I guess, top down view of some advice for people who aren't quite there yet, but want to do maybe specifically videography, filmmaking, certainly in the, the visual arts space. Can you give us, I don't know, Maybe it's personal routine stuff. Maybe mm -hmm. it's professional stuff. Maybe it's educational stuff. Give us some tips and tricks that maybe people can take away with them. Yeah. I think the, the, main, the main point is that you have to really, really, really like what you're trying to do. Because if you just like the, you know, the outcome of it, like, you know, I want to make videos so I can have hundreds of thousands of subscribers then you're not gonna be happy with it you just have to love what you're doing and once you find something that you love just just do it all over again just keep doing it don't stop that's pretty much everything i tell when people ask me like oh how do i you know how do i get better at video just make videos how do i you know get instagram followers just post every day twice a day like think about what you're doing towards that goal and double it. I think that's that's actually a pretty good strategy. <laughs> I think it's a great strategy. Yeah. And, and it works. It works. Like if you put the if you dedicate yourself to one specific thing for the rest of your life, 
you will get there. I think one concern I had before I kind of put that aside and d- did that as well, just whether it's Instagram or this or photography, just do just do it. You'll figure it out. Like, or you'll you'll realize that you haven't figured it out, and then you'll go and f- figure out how to figure it out. That yeah. makes sense. Um, one thing I was definitely concerned with was how do I put stuff out there that people like? You know, it's, and when we live in the world of YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, all the other sh- stuff that's out there, we think that's reality and we think that's like the whole world. Oh my God, there, I need 100,000 people that like me. It's like, well, actually 100,000 people out of 7 billion is fuck all. Yeah. And if you, even 10,000, like if they're if they're real people that, like what you do and like you then that's gold but to get to that point you've got to put yourself out there but consistently right yeah so you know when i was concerned like what if people don't like my niche or my style or but 99.9 percent probability is there are going to be some people that do you're not pitching to the whole world you're not trying to get everyone to like your stuff the acceptance of okay most people either won't see it or won't like it. And that's okay. Like even the biggest celebrities in the world or the biggest uh, athletes or musicians, the majority of the world don't like them, right? But they have a, they have a, they have a, an audience. Yeah. I think that's very, very important for people to understand. Everyone wants to be, I, I just want to be popular on Instagram. I need followers. Like, okay, but you need to identify who's going to like your stuff. There will be, and have faith that there will be people that, like you and like your content so yeah you know it's crazy like you don't even need that many people like no if you find like a thousand people that you resonate with like crazy one thousand people you get all of them to give you like a thousand bucks you're a millionaire yeah one thousand people like we can go down the road and find people. <laughs> like you know like it's not that many people you need to find like you don't need an audience of you know, a hundred of thousand people you just need a thousand very committed ones. Everyone's doing the maths right now. A thousand times a thousand. I think that's something, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, a hundred times a thousand is a hundred thousand. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how do you, what's, what does the future look like for Luca? How do you, uh, you know, do you get concerned about, okay, I've got to keep moving. I've got to evolve. Or are you just kind of seeing where things go? I pretty much at a start, at the end of last year, I kind of sat down with myself and just looked at everything I've done for the year. And I put a lot of effort into personal branding last year. I posted a video on YouTube every single Monday for a year, actually more. Wow. Um, I posted a reel every single day. A reel every day. That's a lot of work. I posted a reel every day and they were For a year? For one year. Holy shit. And they were all original. I didn't repost anything. I shot, edited and posted something different every day. How did that go? Um, became pretty easy, to be honest. Towards the end, I was kind of used to just kind of, you know, go out and shoot enough footage that I can make different type of reels. How it. did it go in terms of the results? Uh, tripled my following. In, in On YouTube and Instagram? On, well, YouTube, how did it go? Uh, YouTube went like, maybe, I went from like a thousand subs to like 7,000, 6,000 something. Cool. Um, just organically. And Instagram, I went from like 14, I think I was, to 34 now, 35, 34, 35. Yeah. Um, so it works. Uh, consistently works. And, but that's not even like the results. It's not what like keeps me hooked. What keeps me hooked is that if I look at what I was posting like a year ago and what I'm posting now and the way I evolved as a filmmaker and just the way I shoot, the way I edit, the way I color grade, all of it, like I, I look at reels that I made or videos, YouTube videos that I made a year ago. And I'm like, why did I post that? Like making so much content made me such a better, like all round filmmaker. And I sat down with myself at the end of last year and I was like, okay, this is what happened. I'm very happy with the results, but I want more because <laughs> we have design. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do I get that? What's the next steps and stuff? And I was like, well, what I can do is staying true to my words, which is if I want to get somewhere else, it just doubled the work that I did last year. 
So I'm going to post a reel every day, but I'm going to step up the quality of the reel. I'm going to make a lot more kind of storytelling, a lot more thought, a lot more like a lot more um, quality overall in the reels. Like sometime last year, I kind of lacked, you know, like, oh, I have to just post something. Let's just quickly edit this. Like this year, I want to every day just, you know, instead of spending an hour into a reel, I'm going to spend two to three hours. Just make that a priority. Instead of spending, you know, five hours a week to make a YouTube video, I'm going to spend like 15 hours and make two YouTube videos a week instead. So I'm going to just like take what I did last year and double it. Wow. Because I see the opportunity that comes with it, first of all. I see where I want to go and the only way to get there is just being consistent. So the opportunity you see with Instagram growth, is that what you're saying? Um, Instagram is just kind of like, um, I think it's still a very important platform and it has just a very easy virality uh, chance, I feel, compared to YouTube. So I think you, it's like staying active on Instagram and posting every day is still very important for like an overall audience. But with that said, I feel like YouTube it is by far like the king of all platforms because of what we talked about before. It's just like the audience that goes on YouTube stays on YouTube. They don't just kind of click away within five seconds. But if you're spending half your day on a reel, essentially, yeah. why is, why is that so important to you to grow, to grow even more on Instagram? Because I can redirect a lot of people towards my other work. And because a lot of the brands that I work with, with YouTube, they also want Instagram kind of linked stuff. And I honestly just like to challenge myself to create a very like six to 10 second reel that is that people stop to watch. I find that very like, very fascinating on how you can learn how to hook people in and i feel like that's a skill <laughs> definitely and that the, the, the byproduct of that is the this time next year you'll be 10x better filmmaker right exactly just because you'll exactly. be doing it every day exactly. whether they're 60 second wheels or yeah bigger youtube ones yeah um, i think that's really important for beginners to understand like you said before just do it but consistently don't do it and then have a couple of months not doing it and then try it again. Just, yeah. just keep doing it. Yeah. Thing is like, here's another quote. I love quotes. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Consistency doesn't guarantee that you'll reach success, but not being consistent will guarantee that you don't reach success. So who said that? Luca? Epifani. No. Um, wow. What's his name? It was on the... Uh, it's a good quote. I can't forget the, the, the podcast, but it was um, Alex Ormozzi. Oh, yeah. Okay. On yeah. this one podcast, but I don't remember the name. <laughs> million dollar offer. A hundred million dollar offer. Um, yeah, he's crazy, but he liked to take a few bits and bobs from, from his experience and his knowledge because he is insane. He is insane. Like he doesn't have a day. I mean, he says, I can't remember the last time I had a, I'd wake up and want to do this. You know? Yeah. Every fucking, I can't, yeah. never have holidays. Yeah. Just do it. I don't fully agree with that, but I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I the, well, part of me goes, what's the point of having millions and millions of dollars? Exactly. Like you, you want to do, he's not doing it for the, he's not doing it purely for the money. He's doing it for the challenge, the process, the experience, and he just loves doing it. Yeah. I think he would do it whether he had 100 million in the bank or 100,000 in the bank, personally. But, um, I feel like there's people just built for that, like Gary Vee. Yeah. It's like working the yeah. whole day, every day. And I'm not one of them. <laughs> no, I'm not one of them. <laughs> but you kind of have to work really hard to get to a point where you don't have to work that exactly, hard. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah, exactly. So. Um, got a question. We're, we're going to end with a couple of questions. Sure. Um, one is from our previous guest, Jakob Kluber. You know Jakob? Uh, I've never met him, but I know okay. all this work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, his question was, you kind of answered this already, but maybe clarify. What is the biggest challenge for you right now? I think can answer it two ways. Can answer it whichever way you want. All right. So the biggest challenge for me right now, it is being able to manage my desire to get where I want to be with my filmmaking career, with my business and my desire to serve. 
Okay. So as a surfer, it is the most addictive thing I ever did in my life. And waking up in the morning and seeing that the waves are perfect, but that I also want to shoot two YouTube videos. It is a very hard choice because if I go surf, I'm happy, but I'm too exhausted afterwards to do pretty much anything, especially like shooting YouTube videos. I just can't get my head around. I need to be fresh. I need to be, you know, like very focused or I can do all the work first and then go surf after, but then it might be a bit windy. <laughs> <laughs> These are great first world problems that you have. It is. Day. It is. Do it I is. surf that, or make a video? That that goes back to you know you know being that's great the freedom part. But yeah. I think that was like that is one of the biggest challenge because I am very addicted to it. Um, and Mel is as well your partner, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but if we're only talking about business side, is just I struggle to focus on the right thing at the right time i feel sometimes like i would be you know waking up in the morning and i'll start doing something and i'm like oh maybe i'll stop this i'll just do this later and then i'll start doing something else and then i kind of stop that and i just i keep putting my attention to the wrong like to different things instead of focusing on one thing and just getting that done and i i think that's just the way i work though i'm just multi tasking i don't like to focus myself on one thing but sometimes the challenge because i want to get that video done but my head is like nope tomorrow <laughs> i know I'm that like, feeling uh, okay whatever <laughs> how do you get in a or should i say where and when are you in a flow state where that focus is like just so dialed in 5 30 a.m until 8 a.m okay like i i am a very early morning person also linked to surf because usually we like surf a lot with sunrise but um work-wise i absolutely love waking up at like 5 to 5 30 and between 5 30 to 7 30 i could do most of the work of my day because i'm just like like my phone is like kind of off on the side there's no distractions it's kind of dark still outside my dog isn't barking because <laughs> <laughs> there's no one on the road um Mel is mostly asleep until like 6.30 or something. So I'm like by myself, just like on my laptop and I get so much shit done. Yeah. And and then it's just downhill from there. But I imagine surfing, if you go surfing as well, that's uh, a flow state in itself. Very therapeutic because you're just... It is. That is, it, nothing else matters. I think, that's, wave. I think that's what I, what's addicted, addicting from it. It's that you're literally in a place where you can't have your phone. Like you're one-on-one -on -one with nature and just the actual like surfing a wave, it is so addictive. Like you always want one more and that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> but luckily we live on the best place on earth for it. So best place on earth. Wow. Yeah. Uluwatu is probably the best place on earth cool. to surf because of the way it's shaped. So interesting. Yeah. We'll leave that for another conversation yeah. because <laughs> I know nothing about surfing, but I'm intrigued. That's right. <laughs> we'll, we'll end with a lucky dip conversation yeah. card. So, right. you know, we talked about this. If you want to just pick any card and then hand it to me. Uh, let's go with that one. Okay. Interesting. Should be scared. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you promise to do to make our world a better place? Oh, that's an easy one. <laughs> surf more surf more that help. work less <laughs> no um i promised a couple of years ago when i actually made the first ngo project and i kind of fell in love with it i just kind of promised myself that i want to tell more true stories rather than just tell what everyone else is telling so that's a perfect example of you know instead of telling you know, the same story about Bali. I want to tell actual story of actual people in Bali. And I think just being able to tell the story of someone who doesn't have the chance of telling their stories and with that, being able to help them. Do you find some people don't want their story told? They don't, they don't get, just leave me alone. 
Mm, not in Bali. Yeah, they're pretty in, friendly. In the, not in Southeast Asia, I feel. Yeah. Um, I'm in not China. sure. I feel like in Asia in general, people are pretty open to it. And they actually enjoy it, especially in Indonesia, especially in Bali. People are the nicest I've ever met, to be honest. But, you know, I guess it's different in the Western world. What about in Italy? Have you ever done much work there? I haven't actually, no. Okay. Yeah. I moved out of Italy when I was 18, so I kind okay. of grew out. Left it behind. It. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you. Thanks so much for joining. Wish you the best of luck with battling your demons when it comes to surfing and making videos <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you for having me. and good luck with the Borneo project and I'm sure hopefully we, we sh definitely should chat about um, maybe collabing on some of the Bali stuff at least when the ceremonies come around because that'd be cool let's um, do it but yeah until then thanks, thanks so much thank you cheers thanks man <laughs>